Uh, hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Libraries in Response on the Road. Our last session, uh, we've been out of town since late May. You may recall we were in Brussels for uh, a, a big data security conference, and we've been we we did a session from the American Library in Paris. Thank you. Uh, Audrey, the librarian there, uh, amazing facility. I recommend anybody go to Paris, go to the American Library in Paris, 100-year-old uh, institution, beautiful facility, right under the Eiffel Tower, uh, opened right after World War One. It's an amazing story. Uh, and now we're, we're in uh, southwest France, and we'll be headed back next week, so we won't be having a session next week but the week after that we will so uh we're here today to again talk about ai only we're going to talk about it in terms of what it can actually do and someone actually using something with it that's relevant to people we hold in high regard which are uh small and rural libraries who are challenged in so many ways mainly in staffing and budgets and, and size and so forth. And so uh, it's, it's, it's really difficult for, for them to respond and especially keep up with technological advances. Uh, so we're going to have a, a case that we're talking about how Diane does that. So we are, well, I am, my name is Don Means. And I'm the director of the Gigabit Libraries Network. I, I think I failed to actually introduce myself on these, but maybe it's unnecessary, but you know, there it is. Um, GLN is an open consortium of interesting. We think libraries doing fascinating things with technology and, and uh, innovation. Our uh, partner in this uh, for the last four and a half years has been uh, IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions based in The Hague with the head of public policy, Stephen Weiber, at the helm here. And it's their Zoom tool we're using and it's recording. And then uh, they, they'll post it for us on the uh, Libraries and Response YouTube channel where all prior hundred and five sessions are located, and this one will too. Uh, our sponsor, our principal sponsor this year is IMLS. Thank you very much, IMLS. And we also have sponsorships from the Internet Society and uh, and the Library of Michigan, uh, the State Library of New Jersey. Hi, Jen, thank you. Uh, also, uh, TSLAC, the Texas State Library, are, are also sponsors helping us put this together. Media sponsorship from Library Journal and from Broadband Breakfast. Thank you all. Um, this is kind of the circumstance. I mean, we are libraries in response. You might say, well, libraries in response to what? Well, in response to an array, a cascade, if you will, of crises that have been coming at us since the pandemic, but not the only one. And there is, I mean, it, and it's it's back, right? Uh, 84 countries have outbreaks of COVID right now, and I was reading California has uh, a pretty intense uh, uh, recurrence. So this thing is not going away. It's just changing, and hopefully it stays relatively benign, but there's no guarantee of that. So that's just always looming, and that's a, a major story on how libraries re did respond to that, and that's part of what we've tracked and and documented here. Uh, but then there's the kind of the other things that are going on, like global meltdown. Um, it, it's just hard to keep up with this stuff now. I mean, this latest storm, Debbie, is just pouring water all over the East Coast. Many of you, I'm sure, are under it. Uh, and it's a story, but it doesn't seem like it's as big a story as it should be because of how much uh, how much devastation is causing around there. I think we're just becoming, you know, so inundated by these events that we're being, you know, kind of uh, inured to the to the impact. Uh, the fires in California are just blazing away. Not only California, Canada, you know, the whole planet is is under siege from various kinds of uh, disasters. And 
how how we deal with that is probably the very question of our time. I mean, when I say our time, I mean humanity's moment. And uh, we're not really looking that good. <clears throat> There's so much that we can do as individuals, even as institutions, certainly libraries, in terms of mitigating this this problem, this crisis. Uh, but there's a lot we can do in terms of just coping with it or adapting to it. And that's a, fo that's a focus that we've been working on for, for some years, actually, in terms of using communication technology to increase community resilience, which we've talked about and we're going to talk about some more, but not today. Uh, today, we're back to AI, which has been uh, kind of our latest crisis. It doesn't fit quite the same profile of of uh, climate change and and uh, global pandemic, though in some ways it does because it is global and it's it's happening at least this version of it is happening feels like rather suddenly. and this is really due to the the end user tool that's arrived on the scene, Chat GPT and it, the other, uh, end user tools. It's been around for a good number of years, but it's basically been run in the background, either uh, at professional uh, applications like uh, automated trading, uh, trading in the in the world of finance, or the you know Facebook and Google using it to uh, analyze our our behavior and tune the content that we see as a result of. It. So it, it's it's around, but it's now it's just in everybody's hands as an end user tool. And that's what's kind of changed. And that's what's uh, causing a lot of people to, well, want to know about it, use it, or run away from it, project about it. I mean, there's so many, so many uh, expectations that are being built or crashed around this. The current one is that it's, that it's just hype. It's overblown. It's not paying off. Wall Street's disappointed. You know, maybe so, but it just feels like to us that it's early and like the web was early and it didn't seem like it changed everything all at once, but yet it changed everything. Everything in the world now is IT connected. Uh, when I say everything, I don't quite mean everything, but I mean a lot of things are uh, are on the network and that's a big change. Um these, this is a list of the sessions. I think it's 13 we've done now related to AI, all available, as I said, on the uh, Libraries and Response YouTube channel. And you can go back and track a lot of interesting comments and presentations there. Uh, we'll have one more today. Uh, I mentioned we're not going to be on next week, but we will be on the week after that with Denise Holt of uh, the Spatial Web. Spatial Web AI is her site, and she writes about this, this phenomena. Uh, and this is the news from just last week, I think, that the IEEE has approved the Spatial Web Protocol. Now, you may know that the Internet runs on protocols like HTTP and TCP IP, and these are things that everybody uses to communicate. It, it was an amazing invention. Uh, when it occurred, because people have been driving people, large organizations principally, have been looking had been looking for ways to to trade and and place orders and communicate basically between their digital systems for a long time. It was really cranked up in the eighties when all the the merger and acquisition activities going on. Large companies were acquiring large companies, but that meant they had to they had to integrate their their computer systems. And that was a, a challenge just to do it internally, not to mention with their trading partners. All that had to do with, well, what kind of communication system do you use? Or what kind of data sets do you use? All that created huge barriers to actually communicating. And then suddenly we have the internet, which was at first seen as well that's it's something like the internet the thing that the, the universities are using to share their information something like that and then well it, yeah, it's actually that and then on top of the internet then lands the world wide web with a graphical interface and a point and click that anybody can use before that you know there was a maybe many of you were around doing command line 
uh, entries onto a computer. Uh, but that that was really resolved by the 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 graphical interface of the web and then the hyperlinks that that started knitting it all together and so it's been a dramatic change uh in civilization if i may since that time and it's also a good example of adaptation how adaptable people are uh you know it should be just mind-blowing to think back on you know just before that this the 80s the world of the 50s which I inhabited, and uh, and even before that, that world was very, 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 very different. And now we're all, you know, electronically enabled or disabled, depending on how you look at it. But we're all dependent upon this system that has arrived and uh, underpins uh, society. So here, perhaps, is a new, a new protocol that will change that. At least that's the way. Diane is is billing it. I, I don't. This is probably extremely technical, but on one level, it should be pretty comprehensible in terms of the the basics of what what she's getting at here. Uh, spatial web. So going to be interesting. Please come back on twenty second. Here's what how she. This is a graphic of the journey of AI from classic, which I talked about before. Narrow now the end user and the general. What we're all kind of talking about, speculating about, and then she's talking about super intelligent AI that, that's just distributed uh, AI. Right now, we've got these monstrous models, right? <clears throat> this is one of the things about AI that's a huge negative is the amount of energy that they require, the amount of materials to build the, the computers and the systems and the wiring to run them and to hold and process all this enor enormous amounts of data required to do this predictive kind of act that AI does. And uh, it just does not seem sustainable. I mean, these numbers are just getting ridiculous. Uh, the heat, the water, the electricity that, you know, we need to, it, it's just counter sustainable uh, in its model. And this is supposed to be something more efficient as a distributed model. We've heard a lot about that, the distributed web. So come back to that. So enough of me, enough of that. And uh, welcome, Diane. Thank you so much for making the time and joining us today. We're happy to have you, and we are most interested to hear and see how you uh, have been using uh, AI to uh, analyze the uh, data that you collect uh, that uh, is contained in the ILS database, which is a really interesting point that, that uh, small libraries have a large amount of data, but they're they don't have the derivative information that they that they can have from it, uh, at least to the to the scale that it seems like the larger systems have. And maybe this is where AI can come in and make a difference. So uh, one other thing I just wanted to say before you start, Diane, is that uh, Diane and I were talking about to do this. She's done this presentation before and uh to do a presentation to show the steps that she did which she will again today or or maybe and to have a session where people that are interested presumably uh, a number of you here in actually doing what she's about to show us she has just done and if so we could just not do a how to but a just do so we'll we'll be well, asking you actually along the way, if if this is something that looks like you're interested to do and might be willing and just put a comment in the chat and we'll take those. And if it looks like there's enough interest, we will reconvene and we will do these live. So with that, I am going to, oh, I'm, I've already stopped sharing. Diane is sharing. Uh, again, Diane, welcome and thank you so much. Thank welcome you. back. Thank you, Don. Um, from Brussels to Paris to Southwest France to Pottsboro, Texas. So <laughs> I, I'm glad to have you all here with me. Um, I'm a practitioner. I'm in a library in a town of 2,600 people. Our all-in operating budget is $39,000 this year. 
And so I am not a data expert. I am not an AI expert. I'm going to tell you how I am using this um, to create outcomes and to make my life easier is what it, what it all boils down to. Because I know a lot of libraries are understaffed, under-resourced. Um, and so I'm just going to show you kind of what, what I've been working on. I do love technology, fascinated by AI. This image I created was with Dolly, and um, we'll be talking about Excel and the AI that is embedded in Excel and chat GPT, the uh, paid version of it, which I pay $20 a month. So this all started with an IMLS grant um, to Providence Public Library. They had a three-year grant called Data for Good, and it was about how libraries could, could learn how to do data visualization and then teach people in our communities to do data visualization and how nonprofits could use this data for good. And so um, we spent, um, I think the three participating libraries, we spent 13 weeks learning Excel, advanced Excel, how to make pivot tables, et cetera. And then, and then Tableau visualization software. And I really wasn't getting the hang of it. Um, it was beyond me, but we did the best we could. And then in the second year of the project, we were able to hire some teenagers, um, teach them these techniques. They used city data, which ended up being um, the water usage for the city. It was in a 341 page Word document. So they had all this data. They didn't know what it meant or what to do with it. The teens were able to extract it, make it into visualizations, um, uh, teach the city how that they could be um, using the, the their data more efficiently. And so it was really a win-win for the teens to get you know, that experience. They did a presentation for city council. It was wonderful. And while I'm thinking of it, um, there is a Web Junction webinar that'll be October 9th at 3 p.m. Eastern time about this Data for Good project. Um, and then they'll also release an online training for libraries who can go through this Excel um, experience using library data. So that will um, give that part of it. But it's not focused on AI. And what I've discovered recently is those 13 weeks of training I got, AI will do those same things for me in a matter of minutes. And, and I get it. And so that's what I wanted to, to share with you. So um, this third year of the grant, what I did is I enlisted some local small and rural libraries and presented a three week, um, one time a week, one hour each on how to use AI for their data. And so um, actually this next slide came from Data for Good when I was using Tableau and um, Excel. And we have authors that are on automatic delivery so that anytime they publish something new, um, those books are delivered. And I wanted to see if they were getting checked out or not. And so we made some changes to those authors because we saw some of them, we were getting them and nobody was checking them out because they had been on that list for years maybe, and maybe somebody used to check them out, but they're not anymore. So Pottsboro um, Library, what we are doing is um, in several ways, looking at how we use our ILS data, and we'll talk about some other data, um, to make decisions. I heard there was um, somebody um, from Boulder, Colorado, who had the quote, <laughs> he's in data for Boulder, Colorado, I wish we knew what we know. Meaning we have all this data 
and it's there, but how are we using it and making sense of it? So session one of the class, we talked, we all have um, different ILS. Um, and so we just talked about exporting the data into Excel format from our ILS. And so we looked at doing that, um, how to configure it and um, thought about what do we want to know? What what information is possibly in there and what would be, we be interested in exploring? And so then we would think of the questions and um, kind of write them down and then think about, okay, what data in the ILS would give us the answer um, to these questions? Because you may not have in the ILS um, the, the information, but all of these we did. And I will say ILS, of course it creates reports, but it wouldn't do comparative reports um, like I wanted. And of course it wouldn't create visualizations. And so um, just making the, the use of that. So exporting data to Excel, I uh, one of the first things I did was just every um, material in our collection, I exported all the information about that. And that was the you know copyright and the author and the circulation and all that information. And what I discovered was a big mess <laughs> um, because for years, our library operated with volunteers um, adding books to the collection and not having truly, you know, structured ways of putting things in. Uh, it just came back such a, such a big mess. Um, and, and so when you're doing this, I think it's true probably across the board that the, one of the biggest steps is cleaning the data. And for instance, in this um, title column there, you can see some of them have book paperback and some don't say that at all, or book hardback, um, just so, and then there were some missing authors and the call numbers are different. So you can actually use AI to clean these up. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't go back to your ILS, and clean them up, but it will give you reports you can work from. And th what this taught us is we need to be much more um, intentional about how things are being entered into our system so that going forward, you know, five years from now, if we export this, it won't be such a, such a mess. We also talked about um, naming conventions for files so that we would pull out, um, I sort by the the uh, date first, and then I have working files and clean files because if you're like me, if you're not careful about how you're naming things, um, you, you can't find what you want when you're looking for it. And so um, again, just being intentional about the work you're doing. So we talked about ILS data, but then we also talked about, um, you know, there's a big push in libraries, as you know, for um, community engagement and being responsive to our particular communities. And so I go into American Community Survey and look at some of the demographics for our area and Typically, I'm just looking for outliers. Does anything jump out at me that would cue me to think, okay, maybe we should have programming around this topic, or maybe we should have, you know, materials around this topic. And so one of the things in this um, that jumped out at me is veterans for our zip code. Um, the, it's 14.5% of the people in our zip code are veterans, which is over twice as many as the state average. And I, I don't know, I, I bet that's hot. I bet Texas is higher than the national average. So that makes me start thinking about, okay, what kind of programs do veterans need? And one example I've seen recently 
is um, one of a, a wife who's a, the couple's a regular patron. He's uh, developed dementia as a veteran, and she's coming in, and she doesn't know where to go for all the resources he needs. And she's really coming to us for help, saying, you know, I, who do I contact, and um, you know, what what should I be looking about? What should I know? And then another thing that we have focused on in our area is people with disabilities. Um, we have a, a higher number in our zip code. So there's that. And then yesterday I had, and I'm not selling for them, but I had a call with um, Placer AI and they have 25 million devices. So cell phones or tablets that they track in the US and it's anonymous data but they showed me all the information they could tell me about Pottsboro. It was shocking um, where people are coming from when they come to our library, like the seven places, Sonic is one, uh, the seven places people are coming from, the seven places they're going to. Um, and so how much information is out there? Right now, this is over our budget. Um, to, to get a contract with them. But it was really interesting for them to develop this heat map. So this is a one year time period they're looking at and they're showing the number of visits. And of course the purple marker is the library. And what's important to me here is seeing um, these areas outside of Pottsboro where we're getting a lot of people from. The reason that is important is we get very little money from um, our county. We get about $2,000 a year from our county. The rest is from the city. And so this would help me make a case with the county that more of our users are coming from outside city limits. So the county needs to um, increase our funding. And believe me, I will be making that case once again. So um, the lots of information. And the other thing we discussed on the call was if I can see what businesses people are going to and from directly from the library and actually which route they're taking in their driving, um, that could inform some decisions on who we have outreach events with or partnerships with or cross promotion with. Um, so lots of potential I'm excited about. So that was the, the first session was how we clean our data. Now, the second session was using the AI that is in Excel and um, in our uh, training sessions, this brought up a, an interesting point because one of the small towns um, said that their town IT department had told them that nobody in, uh, no city employees could use AI. And, um, <laughs> We discussed like, well, that's not really a thing because we're all using AI, even when we're not aware of it all the time. If you're using Grammarly or, or lots and lots of things, we are using it. So it'll be interesting to see how municipalities um, form their policies around it. But um, to just to look at some um, examples of this, and this session, session two ended overlapping with session three, which was session three is specifically chat GPT. But what I discovered is because I am not an Excel expert, I could go to chat GPT and say, what is the formula to change names from all caps to caps and lowercase? And one of the things you'll notice is I don't know the terminology um, for a lot of this. Turns out, I guess it's proper proper case. Um, but I just ask it in a conversational tone. And so it comes back, ChatGPT then gave me the actual formula um, and um, where to put it. And then it's actually got a button that I can copy the code. So I just click on that go over to my Excel tab 
and I can put the the formula right into the the program, which is just amazing. So now I'm in Excel and different versions do have different functionality. And so there's some desktop versions and 365. So, um, and now I separately have Copilot, but before I had Copilot, um, I would could go into my version of Excel and you see this analyze data. So what I've done is I've brought in that cleaned um, Excel spreadsheet of all of our um, all of our, our collection. And actually, this is telling me that that's not in currency form. So I could go in um, easily with AI and change that all to to currency, so it would look like numbers. But let's say I just click on that analyze data button. So then my question, it opens up this box and I say, what is the sum of all time circulations by type? So type over here is adult nonfiction, um, fiction, you know, young adults, all of that stuff. But it also suggests questions to me. Um, and some of those might be interesting and, and some like, no, that's not what I'm looking for. But, you know, clearly it doesn't, it's not to the level yet that it understands what ILS data actually is. So it, it needs our help. It's trying to do its best, but we have to sometimes be specific with it. And so what is the sum of all time circs by type? And it brought this up for me. So it gave me a pivot chart, which before when I was trying to do it in Excel, I never knew what was a row, what was a column. I had to just go back and forth and play with it till I would get it right. Um, and this did it for me. And then the, the insert pivot chart, you just click on it. It opens a new sheet and plugs it right in. So it gave me the breakdown here in this um, table form and, and then a bar chart. So one of the things we learned is, oh, easy readers are circulating more than um, double what adult fiction is, which on one hand, that's understandable because a lot of time easy books, people will get a stack of, you know, seven or eight books and many people will just check out one or two adult fiction. But we did look at the, that more carefully then and say, okay, our budget is overwhelmingly going to purchase adult fiction. Let's look at um, reallocating some of that money and putting it into easy readers where people are really um, checking things out at a higher rate. And then um, in the class, we had the training session, we had discussed what data people had that they wanted more information about. And I don't have a door counter at my library. It's just whoever's sitting at the front desk makes a little tick mark as people come in. But this library had a door counter. And it, once an hour, it's recording how many ins and separately how many outs. Um, but they didn't know how to interpret that data. So in this training session, um, and luckily because it was a door counter, that was very clean information. We um, imported it into Excel and hit that analyze data button. And here's what it started giving us. Um, by the days of the week and the hour of the day, um, the total for how many ends. It, it did outs too, which I couldn't figure out exactly why. So I just said, okay, let's just look at it coming in. So it creates this table for us. Um, and then we said, okay, how about the percentage for the days of the week? So we can, maybe if you're looking at staffing or if, you know, if you were able um, to think about open more hours or some hours you would have to close. And Wednesday, you can see here is the greatest percentage of people coming in the library 
19.43%. Um, and then they probably have shorter hours Saturday and Sunday, but that, that gives us information we need to work with. And then I said, okay, create a bar chart. And um, it's color coded. You can see the legend at the bottom. And when we get the peaks and what time of day, so let's see, that's, I think that's Friday at three o'clock is, is our peak for the week and all of that information. So not only can this information be used um, internally for us, but also to our stakeholders, to our um, city council at budget time or um, our boards. And then also once we know how to do it, library staff, we're able to teach people in our community how to do it. And I know we have nonprofits like our um, fire department and EMTs here are all volunteers. They have a huge fundraiser once a year that raises about $100,000 in a horse arena. So they have all kinds of data they've collected and it's important information but they don't know what to do with it. So not only can we use it for ourselves, but we can use it for good in our community as well. And I always, I think I think strategically, like what is gonna boost the library's image in our area because funding is so critical. And this makes us look um, really smart. We've also done the library um, at the beginning of the year, did a teacher in service at the um, school district on how to use AI. So in our area, we're known as the technology leader and that elevates our image um, with some stakeholders who could provide funding. And then session three was utilizing chat GPT. Again, I mentioned I use the, the paid version because you can, um, upload Excel into um, spreadsheets. You can upload data, whatever format into the paid version, but at least right now you can't do it um, with the free version. So um, it's going to give us those visualizations that Tableau had done. By the way, Tableau has its own AI embedded in it right now or now. And so, this is how I look at data. So I'll give you a little insight into, into my, my mind um, for how I can use it. And, and all of these things I'm showing, um, once the data is pretty much cleaned up, um, it, it gives me answers within 30 seconds. So the whole process can be within 10 minutes or less. So, um, I mentioned our, our small operating budget. Well, we have a new city manager who's been here about a month and it's budget time now. And so she let us know that she was thinking of completely eliminating the library budget, um, that the city didn't have the money for it. And uh, keep in mind, we do you know, present to city council. We do all the things that I think we should do. We include them on our newsletters, et cetera. Um, but of course, the city manager wants to see some information, like why should the city be paying for your library? So I went to the Texas State Library. They have public um, data, and I pulled out all the data. And what I wanted to look at is how much is their local government and all these other municipalities and compared to the, the service population. So I, I, in this example, I took the three counties, Grayson, which is ours, and the two surrounding counties, and um, Sherman, Denison, Cook County are all much li larger libraries. But then I start, um, you know, going through all the other, and some of these are, um, you know, smaller. And then we get way over here to Pottsboro. So here's the, what our city gives us compared to our service population, which is, you know, outsizing what the city gives us. 
So how did I get there? I uploaded the um, spreadsheet, the Excel spreadsheet that our state library had made. And um, so it was clean. It was all, you know, nice. Um, and I uploaded it and I said to chat GPT, list all the libraries in Grayson, Fannin and Cook counties. And then if you haven't used it before, you'll see here's the list. It tells me what it gave me. And then I can download the spreadsheet it has created, or I can open it up to look. This is just sort of a preview version, so I can open it up to look at the full thing. So, I, and I will say I am not a perfectionist at all. Um, so when I approach this, I just start asking it questions in a very conversational way. Um, What's interesting to me is I've had some discussions with um, data experts and, and perfectionists who say they spend a lot of time writing their prompts so that first version, first iteration can, can get everything that they're looking for. Um, and that's not my approach is always to just like jump in and start playing with it. And so after it did that, I said, Okay, add local government expenditures and service population and put it in order, descending order by local government expenditures. So it did that. Um, and then this a top picture there is a line of what it gave me. And I could see that this is just a number and I wanted it to um, you know, have the dollar sign and be currency. So I said, make the 4.3 column currency. It gave me back that. And then, um, wow, <laughs> uh, expenditures. Um, and then it gave me back this. And I said, you know what? I don't want the two uh, numbers after the decimal, decimal points. And so I just said, in whole dollars. And that's what it gave to me. Um, then I said, create a side-by-side -side bar chart of local government expenditures and service population. And this is what it gave me. And of course you could tell it colors or whatever you wanted. And it says, here's a side-by-side -side bar chart showing you that. And um, this chart, I still don't know what it's trying. I guess it's because it's the same, same axis, but this made no sense to me. It didn't tell me anything. So I go back and just talk to it like it's a friend. What kind of chart would make more sense? And um, it gives me this little education here, scatter plots and all this stuff. But down here, it's telling me for the specific case that I am looking at, a dual axis bar chart might make the most sense. Um, or if those two scales are similar, then maybe I could use a clustered bar chart. But my two scales, service population and government expenditures, weren't similar. So, I, okay, I want a dual axis bar chart. And I would not have known the language to use um, to create that. But I make a dual axis bar chart. Now this makes sense to me. Um, so it comes back with this tells me again the x axis and y axis and you know listing the library name and then i wanted just one other um addition i wanted it to add a legend so tell me that those blue bars are the local government expenditures and orange is service population and so i could um move that around as i needed and um I guess kind of to close out what I will say is I do believe in just jumping in. I think it is um, important in the beginning that we are using, we're asking it questions that really we know the answers to. So if it gives us something funny, we can catch the mistake. For instance, um, before I said, give me information for the, these three counties, I had told Jack GPT, give me um, information for the region because in the state library um, information, there was a column 
called region, and it kept not including Pottsboro in the list of libraries. So I said, why aren't you including Pottsboro? It came back to me and said, Pottsboro is in this other region, um, which didn't even, wasn't a region that, that our state library has. And so when I looked at the spreadsheet I had imported, there were some extra information down at the, the bottom. So I just deleted that and then went back. But what I'm saying is it might be good to um, use data sets that you really know so that you can build trust with it. And then I think it's very interesting to compare both um, using Excel and if you have a, a data expert, you know, somebody who could do it the old fashioned way in Excel, or if not do it the AI analyzed data way in Excel, and then compare that to chat GPT, because it is not perfect yet. I know um, Washington State Library, I believe had tried to do this with all of their state library and they were getting some um, funky answers. So that that's you know my my recommendation for that is just um using it but i will tell you for administrative task um this has been a huge time saver it's been a very um short learning curve for me i mean every day new information is coming out but this is not something that i needed to understand how to be a data analyst or uh, any kind of AI expert, I just started plugging in information and asking it what it could tell me. And the other thing it will you can do is say, do you see any trends? And it might say, um, your June 2023 circulation was way up over any other time. So then you could look at, okay, were we running some kind of um, social media you know, marketing, or was there some program, what would cause these outliers? So I like to look at, you know, just do you see anything interesting in this and talking to it in that way? And, and it will show you, you know, trends and um, insights. So I will stop sharing. And wow. that's my spiel. Wow. Uh... That is just amazing, uh, Diane. Uh, the first question relates to uh, cleaning the data. So that has to be done. How much time did that take? Um, because ours was so messy, it took me, I, I don't know, maybe an hour um, to, to say, okay, look, that column is all crazy. So I have to ask it this question and, you know, that kind of thing. That's not much. I mean, I don't think it's that much. Of course, it's not my time. It's yours. But... <laughs> Thanks, Don. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I will say too, the other thing, you know, we're big about privacy in libraries. So I have not uploaded any patron information into uh, chat GPT. When I cleaned it, I took out all the identifying information. So I'm just looking at collection and circulation, that stuff. Uh, I'm sure that's a question people had. So thank you for asking, uh, answering that. Uh, the other fascinating part, besides being able to get useful results that you can use yourself to make decisions internally, but also that you can use externally to so like the council who's making, you know, decisions about the library without any information, just whatever they think at the moment or what they prefer to think. <clears throat> so having real, real data is, uh, uh, sounds like it was really helpful. But the other thing that impressed me was uh, interacting with this tool using natural language. You know, like you see any patterns, anything unusual or, you know, and just, working with it like that as opposed to programming it or having specific commands that you need to know, not to mention terms. So that sounds like a real, a real advantage to this stuff. Mm -hmm. It is. It, it makes it so accessible. And I will say, spoiler alert, they completely um, 
matched last year's budget with this year's budget. I can't say it's all AI that did it. We do have some of our board members who are married to council members that may have had something to do with it, but our budget uh, has uh, been that's, state. That's a good point <laughs> itself, really. Uh, but, um, well, uh, so how long, let me, let me back it up because we mentioned we were talking about doing a workshop. So an hour to clean up data and then to start and then how long or how yeah how long would you say it would take to actually walk through this um if we did it as as a live workshop well i and maybe well i started to say you could do excel and chat gpt separately but there is so much overlap i think you do need to to do both cleaning the data would be the most important part so maybe we could start with like one set of data and say, okay, bring all of your um, books and categories and circulation. So bring an Excel spreadsheet that just has those three uh, columns and then we can work with it. Okay. Okay. And then, so that would be kind of homework in advance of the workshop. And then with the, in the workshop, you think, what, like two sessions or three or one for two hours? Or what do you think that would be? I think you could do, once the data is clean, so if everybody was able to do that in um, before it started it, I think you could do two sessions, the one for Excel, maybe an hour and a half Excel and an hour and a half chat GPT and let everybody work through their own data. That that sounds reasonable. Then you could pick up things that people discovered, and you know you just don't want to have a single shot at at uh, getting questions answered and so forth. So that's oh, that's reasonable. Don, I did want to say too, since this um, grew out of the the IMLS grant, um, I was able at our third week of training for the classes I did. Um, an uh, IMLS evaluator, Linda Braun, attended that whole session, and then she stayed after to get feedback um, from the participants. Um, mm -hmm. I logged off, and um, then she gave me the debrief of it, and people were very excited, built awareness, all that stuff. The one, um, the, the feedback she gave me is people need a next step after they know how to do it then how do they implement it in their workflow? Because yeah. people are uncertain, like, okay, I get it, but how? when am I going right. to start using it? Yeah. So is that is that like a follow-up session or is that, uh -huh. okay. All so, right. So you and I can kind of noodle about this. If anybody has any ideas from listening and their own experience, please weigh in now. Uh, but what I think Diane and I will do is think about uh, a workshop date and a format and then send out an invitation to everybody that registered for today. Maybe we could send it to the whole list, might as well, and uh, and just see how many people would like to do that. Uh, one question that, of course, is relevant is uh, whether or not you have the paid version of ChatGPT. So I have no idea. That would be a question we would ask uh, people on, in a, in a sign-up. Uh, if anybody does, well, we'll just save that for the questions because that's going to be, a, that'll, hopefully that won't be much of a barrier. If it is something we can solve, uh, but we'll see. Uh, anybody have any more comments about a workshop? Because that's kind of the the next step for this. You're getting a lot of compliments, uh, by the way, Diane, in the chat. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but you mm -hmm. seem to have won some friends here. Thank <laughs> Good. You. Yeah, let's make our lives easier. Um, yes, yes. Well, let's find out if it actually does that. And it seems like you're convinced that it does, and uh, I don't think you're going to lose any, you know, skills that you've earned the old fashioned way as a result of it. Doesn't sound like that. Uh, sounds like, you know, skills you never had, like, you know, being uh, a spreadsheet pro 
okay, we just that guy gonna have to do that at all. <laughs> pivot charts so, in one? Yeah. <laughs> if you know how to use pivot charts in Love Excel, be my guess, but I did not. Okay. Well, we're getting we're getting some good uh, positive feedback here on workshop. So I think we will follow up with that for sure. Any other comments anybody wants to put in the chat or even say, if you'd like to say something, you're, you're welcome to. It's open mic. And uh, I, I would also like to ask Don, um, if people have ideas, suggestions on what questions that they would like answered by their ILS data, is there oh. something um, like a percentage of cardholders who live in specific zip codes or some of the questions we have to answer for annual reports, like what percentage of your collection has a copyright date in the last five years? Um, right. So any any questions people are curious about would be helpful in designing the, the class. I, I didn't get quite this. You remind me, you talked about... Uh you know, your service area as opposed to your city limits. And that's very relevant, of course. And so how did you, how did you track that? Or are, are, are those the people that have library cards? And so you, you know, those, their locations. The the heat map I showed was actually from this new AI serve or an AI service that a lot of municipalities are using called placer.ai. Um, and so it's beyond my budget right now, but that came from, she gave me a, a trial thing showing, oh, 10% of people go to Sonic first, then come to you and then go to Sherman Town Center. It, it was fascinating. And it's, they're tracking 25 million devices and wow. Pottsboro, Texas, they know where people are coming and going. Wow. Well, that would be interesting to investigate uh, as another layer. And, um, uh... Uh, Rose points out that advantage of a workshop is, you know, just the different people in the workshop can can give perspective to each other, not just kind of following a a, a script. Uh, Sina, Sina says free allows for some limited upload capability. Okay. If you want to play out on their own that's uh that's an option so okay that's good to know um twenty dollars a month it's it's not nothing but it's not terrible especially if you know it if it could make a difference of uh, uh, a couple of thousand dollars in your budget it'd be a pretty good investment mm -hmm. uh sorry i'm just scanning the chat here yeah okay 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 all right. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, yeah. Well, the first part was me, so you didn't really miss anything. So uh, we should have the recording up uh, tomorrow. Hopefully it'll be up tomorrow. And um, it will be on our uh, YouTube channel whenever it's up, as everything is. And uh, so... I'm encouraged, Diane. I mean, I, I'm I, I was encouraged before we started, but you know, it just seems seems just extremely practical and reasonable thing to do uh, with these tools. And the thing I've learned about technology, mostly just as a user, I'm I'm not especially technical, is that there's just an initial barrier on so many things that's just thin, but you just can't see through it. You just can't imagine doing it and then you know you do it somebody kind of pushes you or it's easy or something and you go really that was all it was that's all it took and then you go well, okay I, now i've got it i'm gonna i'm gonna ride the bicycle from here you know that kind of a thing so um uh, good well we're on the hour uh i appreciate everybody's time this has been highly successful uh we'll we've got everybody's comment here and we'll review the chat and we will follow up with a proposal on a date, I guess next month we talked about it. Uh, I'm trying to do it before then. Uh, that was the last question I had uh, dates. Are there specific dates related to reporting 
or receiving ILS data that are relevant to this? It's just an ongoing thing. How does how does that work? Well, for Texas at least, um, kind of opens usually in January, and by March, April, we have to have all our data into them. I don't know if that's the same nationally. I don't know. I don't know. Does anybody know about the timing for ILS reporting? or It varies which group you're in. So they're in, what, three different groupings? Um, so the time frame is different for all of us around the nation. Uh, makes sense. So IMLS doesn't they're spreading their own work out. That makes sense too. So kind of a rolling thing then. So that's, that's not a hard uh, date. Uh, okay. Well, good. With that, I think we'll close the session and I will stop the recording.